Hey, good morning, Mount Zion Church. How we doing? Good, good, good. So it is a beautiful day today, and it's good to be here to worship our Lord, to come together in God's house. And so I'm glad you're here. And if you're a guest here, if this is your first time here, perhaps in person or visiting us online, we want to say welcome to you. So glad that you've come. When you came in, you received a bulletin. And on the bulletin, there's a place to jot down your information. We'd love to be able to reach out to you. You can fill that out and put it in the offering containers around. Or if you're online, you can fill out a connection card. It's in the right-hand corner, and then we can reach out to you that way as well. So, so glad, especially if, if you're a guest with us today, we want to say welcome to you. So um, this morning at 11 o'clock, we have Beyond Capernaum starting back up. They've had a service for a number of years, and um, it's always been at the 11 o'clock time frame over in the youth tent. And so they're starting back again for the first time today in a long time. So that is just awesome to see things getting moving in the right direction. And um, so be, be in prayer for uh, Beyond Capernaum and that ministry. Coming up this Saturday, we have pop-up praise opportunity. So we're going to meet here at 1030. And then we're going to go to someone's house and, what did I say? Um, praise it up or get our praise on, something like that. But pop up praise, we're going to go to someone's house and sing, kind of like Christmas caroling, but not Christmas carols. So uh, this has been postponed a few times because of weather, but I think it'll be nice this Saturday. So um, come join us. And then let's see. Calling all musicians, vocalists, tech team. I know Steve and the tech team, they're in need, always in need. So if you would like more information on that and want to help out in this awesome ministry, see Steve. He'll get you an audition. I heard Pastor Craig did audition, but it didn't work out so well. So, But um, anyways, yes, he would, he would love to be able to talk with you and, and get you on this, this worship team. Um, and then Thursday night, we have Celebrate Recovery, and I, I, I hear they're having a special guest speaker. Pastor Craig will be there, and it's the day after St. Patty's Day, so he'll be all revved up and ready to go. Um, so that's this Thursday evening, Celebrate Recovery. Um, hey, let's stand up together. We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for loving us for never leaving us or forsaking us. We thank you, Lord, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you that you, you love us so much that you sent your Son to this world for us. And, Lord, that he went to the cross for us. Um, and, Lord, he conquered the grave. You rose him up. He conquered death. So I just thank you we can come here and celebrate your good news today. We love you, Lord. We give this time to you. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And all hail the power of Jesus' name, the wonders of his grace. I Savior and all bow before the King of Love, our treasure and our God, Redeemer. There is none more holy, great, and mighty, no one like our God. Kings and God of grace. We crown you, we crown you. Our Redeemer, strong to save. We crown you, we crown you. High and holy, lifted up. There is none more worthy, Lord. We crown you, Lord of Praise, our 
grateful hearts we raise to you, our treasure. The whole rise, shout a victory cry, cause Jesus is alive, and we have been forgiven. There is no
a state with you I'm resurrected you overcame the grave with you I stand in victory now what else could I need with you I want for nothing Jesus spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my Sing this out. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. This salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living. Set me free, Hallelujah. 
the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me amen sing that again then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus yours is the God, we lift our hearts up to you and we praise you, Father. We give thanks to you. You have loved us. You have been so good to us, Lord God, all the days of our lives. And we are here to worship you this morning, Father. We come with such gratitude, Father. You gave your son, Jesus, for all of us. Lord God, you have sought us out. Wherever we have been, Lord, you came calling to our hearts. You came looking for us, Lord, and we are so very, very grateful. We ask, uh, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit upon us now. Father, as Jesus is lifted up in this place, Lord, that you would draw our hearts all the more to yourself, that you would increase our faith, increase our love for you, Father. We pray for all those on our hearts, for all of your people in every place. We come, Lord, looking to you, trusting in you, praising you this day. We come in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You were given a communion packet when you came. If you could take that and don't open it yet. If you could have a seat, just hold that packet in your hand. And we're going to share in the Lord's Supper here. I'm going to break the bread and lift up the cup. But just, just hold it for now. Don't open it yet. And we want to all just watch as this bread is broken and this cup is lifted up here. Well, it was the night before he went to that cross. The same night that one of his own disciples betrayed him. That Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, and he gave it to them. He said, this is my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Drink this and be glad. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We love you, Lord God. We come to you humbly, thanking you that he went to that cross, thanking you, Lord God, that he poured out his life for us there. Father, as we take this bread now, as we take this cup now, Lord God, we pray, Father, that you would feed us, that we would drink deeply of this great, great love. We come to you humbly, confessing our sin trusting in the love of Jesus. If you have faith in Jesus, take the bread, drink from the cup. If you don't have that faith, you could put your faith in him right now. He is a great, he is a wonderful God. Amen.
Oh, Lord God, we do thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Father. We love you. We are here because he went to that cross for all of us. We are here in this great love, Lord God, thanking you for such love, such amazing love. Asking, Lord God, as we go to your word, that we could like Peter and James and John and Andrew just sitting there around Jesus that night as he spoke to them. Speak to our hearts here this day, Lord God, here in your house. We thank you and we love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. What a great God we have. Amen. Let's give thanks to our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be here and we do welcome you. So uh, on this um, Spring Forward uh, Sunday, we'll watch everyone come in 45 minutes later. So, uh, <laughs> so what happens every year on this day is the, the 11 o'clock service then gets twice the size as it usually is. So I'm glad you set your clocks ahead and you are here. If you are visiting with us here today for the first time, we do welcome you. And we try very hard to be a family, a team working together, bringing the good news, the love of Jesus to this very lost world. We try to get strong in the word of God. We try to put our faith in Jesus into action, reaching this, this lost world with his love. And we welcome you in that bulletin or just a whole list of ways to, to get plugged in. Uh, Andy, who was standing up here uh, as we got started, he, is, uh, he helps folks get plugged into what we call connecting groups. And I hope maybe you'll consider becoming part of a connecting group. We have something very exciting coming up starting in May. We're going to do a, uh, a church-wide uh, sermon series, but also hoping everyone in the church will get in a connecting group uh, for, for six weeks. I think it's six weeks. Yep. And uh, we're really excited about that. You'll be hearing more and more about that. But I hope you won't wait until May. I hope you'll get into a group right now. We have 40-some, almost 50 connecting groups. And it's just so important for us to avoid being isolated. And in this COVID season, it's been really easy to get isolated. So these connecting groups are just wonderful. So as we go to the Word this morning, we've been asking the question for the last number of weeks, what happened on that cross when Jesus died there? Beyond what they could see with their eyes, what was really going on? They could see someone dying a horrible death. But that wasn't unusual for somebody living in the Roman Empire. The Roman government always put the crosses, these instruments of execution, right along major roads, and they crucified literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of persons in their empire. Uh, there was a slave rebellion in Rome at one point, and for like, I think it was like 25 miles out from Rome, all the roads went like spokes into a wheel. They had slaves hanging on crosses like every hundred yards or something like that, just for miles. So it wasn't unusual to see somebody die a horrible death on a cross. But what was happening when Jesus died on that cross? I believe with all my heart, I believe what the Bible is telling us is that was the central event of all of history. It wasn't the end of Jesus' work. It wasn't the end. He died on that cross. The Father raised him up and he ascended, you remember, to the right hand of the Father. But he will come again to this earth when that last trumpet of history sounds to conclude the work. But the decisive battle was fought there on that cross. So we've been asking what happened there. Here's the answer we're going to look at uh, this morning. And that is that when Jesus died on that cross, he purchased you and me. Because Jesus died on that cross, we belong to him. Now, even though the Bible says that straight up, it sounds pretty weird to us, doesn't it? Wait a minute. He purchased me. I belong to him. I, you know, we are very independent minded people. We're very, we, we, we like to say to ourselves, I don't belong to anybody. And here's Jesus saying, no, I purchased you. You belong, you belong to me. So I have Scots-Irish ancestry. So the Scots-Irish were pushed around terribly in Scotland. It was the poor, they were the poorest of the poor. They moved over to Ireland because there were these big, uh, the English were stealing all the land from the Irish and opening these big plantations. And they persuaded these dirt poor people to move over there and work on their plantations. So it was horrible for them in Scotland. 
It was twice as horrible for them in Ireland. They came here to America starting in the early 1700s. They weren't welcomed along the East Coast. They moved out to the Appalachian Mountains, and they were just pure rebels. They were tired of being pushed around. They were tired of anybody telling them what to do. And now you tell a Scots-Irishman like me, I belong to somebody? Our tendency is to say, I belong to me. Nobody owns me but me. And here's God saying, no, no, I purchased you. I purchased you when my son died on that cross. And here's what I want us to see this morning. And that is when you know you belong to Jesus, there is a strength, there is a courage, there is a confidence that comes in knowing you belong to Jesus. A strength, a courage, a confidence that cannot be found any other way. It's the very opposite of what we tend to feel or think, that this is a bad thing to belong to somebody. No, it is an awesome thing to belong to Jesus because you will have that strength. You will have that courage. You will have that confidence that cannot be found any other way. So what we're going to look at, first of all, is our problem. Why did he have to go to the cross? God's answer, what he did there on that cross. And then we're going to look at a few different ways that that strength and that courage comes to us when you know you belong to Jesus. So let's look at Psalm 24. We'll begin here. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. So what's that telling us? It's telling us that this whole world belongs to God. Everything in it and everybody in it. We all belong to God. What an awesome world this would be if we could all just remember that, that we all belong to God. I, I, how could I hurt my neighbor? How could I hate my enemy if I remember that my neighbor, even my enemy, belong to God? Belong to God. How, I, we can't hurt, I can't hurt somebody who belongs to God. How, why would we pollute this world the way we're polluting it if we would remember this world belongs to God? This world belongs to God, but we don't remember it. And so our rebel hearts, it's not just us Scots-Irish who are rebels, our rebel hearts say, I don't want to belong to anybody. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. You read in the Bible that you're a slave of God. I'm a slave of God? What? What? And so what do we do? We rebel. So you remember when the devil uh, took, uh, you know, the form of a serpent, showed up there, Adam and Eve are in the garden. And he says, did God tell you you can't eat from any of these wonderful trees with all this fruit here in this garden? And Eve says, no, we can eat of any one of these trees except that one over there, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told us if we eat from that tree, we will die. And so what does the devil say? Look here in Genesis chapter 3. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. You won't die. Look at verse five. He goes on. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here's the devil saying, now Eve, Adam, that God just doesn't want you to know good and evil. He just wants to keep your eyes shut. He just wants you having to listen to him and do what he tells you. Are you going to let him boss you around? That's exactly what the devil's saying to him. You're going to let that God boss you around? You're going to let that God own you? And so, whew, that gets hold of their rebel hearts. Now, I, I remember uh, one time talking to one of my children and saying, well, why didn't God just make us so that we, we wouldn't just want to do, you know, all these wrong things? And I said, well, you know what? He didn't make us to be robots. He made us to be like him, to love as he loves. And to love means you have to be able to choose. If I'm just a robot programmed to love you, what kind of love would that be? That wouldn't be love at all. And I, I said to her as I was talking to her, I said, now, if I was just programmed to love you and I couldn't do anything except love you, would you feel loved at all? No. God created us to be able to choose created us in his image to be able to choose as he chooses to choose to love or not. But with the ability to choose, we can also choose to rebel, to say no. So Adam and Eve say no. 
They say, no, we're, we're not going to belong to God. We're going to take from that tree. We're going to make up our own minds about right and wrong, uh, good and evil. Uh, and we're just going to belong to ourselves. And what happens? They and all of us, because the devil has come whispering the same thing in all of our ears, have become slaves to everything. They thought they were getting free. We think we're getting free when we say, I'm, I'm a big boy, I'm a big girl. I'll decide how I'm going to live. We think we're getting free, and we end up becoming slaves to everything. We become slaves to all the fears of this world, slaves to the anger of this world, slaves to the greed of this world, slaves to the selfishness of this world, and every sin that you can read about in the Bible, we become slaves of something, every single one of us. And so look in John chapter 8 here. What Jesus said one time, he answered them. He was talking to the religious leaders who thought that they didn't belong to anybody. Jesus answered them, truly, truly. By the way, the words truly, truly, amen, amen. I say to you, in other words, listen carefully. This is what you can say amen to. I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And maybe when you read that word sin, you might say rebellion. We become a slave to our rebellious hearts. We become a slave to the things that our rebellious hearts lead us to. We think that we're our own people. We think that we're the master of our own destiny. And we end up becoming slaves. Slaves to this, that, the other. We end up even becoming slaves of ourselves. Slaves of our brains that we can't control. Slaves of our hearts that just go here, there, and everywhere. And so uh, let's uh, look at the book of Romans here. Paul writes this, he says, for when you were slaves of sin, now he's talking to people who got delivered from that slavery, but he says, when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Righteousness is the life that, that Jesus calls you to, the life that God commands you to live. He says, you were free from that. You turned your back on that and walked away from that, but you became slaves to wh whatever it is that you grabbed hold of. And we all grab hold of something different, but we all end up a slave of something. I talked to someone uh, a couple weeks ago who uh, she was just going on and on and it was obvious she was a slave of her fears, a slave of her worries. She couldn't escape them. They just, just held her mind all the time and all the time and all the time. So free from righteousness, yet when we turn our back on God, we rebel against God. But look at verse 21. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? He said, but what good did it do you? You got away from God, so he wasn't bossing you around anymore. But what good did it do you? Did you get any fruit, any good fruit from that? He says, for the end of those things is death. All that happened was you walked away from this amazing, incredible God, and you just walked into some kind of slavery that just takes you on into that outer darkness, utter separation from God. And so how many times have you talked to somebody or maybe thought to yourself, how did I end up where I'm at? I never thought I'd end up here. I never thought I'd end up with this kind of craziness in my head. And so Paul says, yep, we, we just have nothing good from turning our back on God. So, so this first thing, our problem, we belong to God, but we rebel against God and become slaves of everything. Everything we can imagine. So what's God's answer to all of that? Look here in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. He says, in him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. Uh, somebody in the Roman Empire would have known the word that Paul wrote when he, he wrote redemption. If you were a slave and somebody paid the redemption price, they, you were set free. A price was paid to set you free. So Jesus paid this price with his death on the cross. In him we have redemption through his blood. I paid a price for you. I saw your slavery. Even though we turned our back on him and walked away from him, he sees the slavery that we're in. He sees the misery that we're heading to. He sees the outer darkness, the flames of hell beyond us. And he comes in incredible mercy and grace and love and pays the price through his blood the price of hell, the price of that hell that we're stumbling toward. He paid 
the price of that on that cross, the forgiveness of our trespasses. He doesn't hold it against us that we turned our back on him. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. This amazing grace, this undeserved love, this undeserved kindness and mercy. It, it, the, according to the riches of his grace, Jesus is rich in grace. He, he's filled with grace. His heart is filled with grace. And so he comes and pays that price, pays that price to set us free from our slavery. But what does that mean? Again, we belong to him. Again, we belong. The price has been paid for all of us. Now, of course, the question is, do I say, hey, thanks, see you later, and just stumble on into slavery again? Do I look at what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago and say, uh, yeah, I don't really believe that. It's kind of crazy. Uh, I'm not a slave. Come on, I'm my own person, and just ignore it? Ignore the slavery that is ahead of us? Maybe you don't feel like a slave at all to anything, but you're ignoring what's ahead of you. Just look around. Just look around and we see. So we can ignore it or we can say, you know what? <laughs> you know what? I would be much better off belonging to him than belonging to myself, than belonging to this fear, than belonging to this anger, than belonging to, to whatever it is that has gotten hold of me. I would be much better off belonging to him. Wow. So let's think about that. So that's our problem. Our problem, we, we just turn our back on God and become slaves of everything. God's answer, he pays the price to set us free. So when you know to set us free from our slavery. So a lot of times we hear that set us free. Woo, I am free. Freedom, 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 right? And we forget he set us free from slaves so that we would belong to him. Some of you uh, came, we showed the movie a number of weeks ago, uh, Tortured for Christ, true story of Richard Wormbrandt. And he was a pastor in Romania when the Soviets conquered the nation and the Soviets were just crushing the churches in Romania. Either you, you bowed down to them and did church the way they told you to do it or they crushed you. He got arrested. He was held in a Soviet prison for 14 years. He was tortured horribly and they were trying to beat out of him, you know, names of others who were resisting the, the Soviets, other Christians. And what did he keep saying over and over again? This movie, true story from... he. He was eventually released because Christians here in America negotiated with the Soviets and paid enough money to get him out of there and his wife out of that country, came to America, wrote his whole story down. What did he say over and over again to his torturers trying to beat out of him these answers? He kept saying, I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. Whew. When you know you belong to Jesus, the price has been paid. He didn't belong to those Soviets. He didn't belong to the pain that they were, the horrible pain that they were inflicting on him. He preached at this church 30 years ago. He had to sit down while he preached because they had beaten him so severely he couldn't stand for long periods of time. But he didn't belong to that pain. He belonged to Jesus. Wow. So let's look at how does this work then that you get the strength and the courage and the confidence by knowing who you belong to, by, by knowing what he did for you there on that cross and saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, by looking to him, trusting in him, putting my faith in him and saying, yes, I will be yours. How does that strength and that courage and that confidence come? Let's look in 1 Corinthians here. Paul is writing a letter to a group of Christians in this Roman city of Corinth, so if you think that our society and our world today is decadent, you're right, but multiply by 100 and you have the ancient Roman Empire. And so all of these Christians in Corinth, this is the first generation of Christians in that city of Corinth, they were used to this incredibly decadent society that they lived in. And there were temples to all the different gods that you could imagine, that the Romans and the Greek gods and all the rest of it. And you, you went to those temples, but it wasn't anything like church. Everybody's getting high. That was the point. It was just the ancient version of heroin, opium. Everybody's getting high. They're getting drunk. And you're going there because of the prostitutes in the temple. And that's what it was. 
And that's how everybody lived. But Jesus gets hold of this group of people. And so here Paul is writing about getting away from all that immorality, all that sexual immorality, all of that getting high, all of the ways of living that they had just known as Roman citizens. So he says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? He's drawing a contrast between the temples that they were going to, you know, Zeus and Hercules and all the horrors and the, the mess and the immorality in those temples. He says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is within you. The Spirit of God is within you, whom you have from God. And look at this. You are not your own. You don't belong to yourself. You're not your own. The Spirit of God is on the throne of your heart. You belong to him. At verse 20 then, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And here we see this first of all, that when you know you belong to Jesus, you have an incredible strength, courage, and confidence to say no to sin. To say no, and again, think rebellion. To say no to this rebellious heart which says, God, I'm really tired of this Christian life that I'm living. I need to go live a little bit. I need to go do my thing. You have the strength to say no. Say no, I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. The spirit of God is in my heart. God is with me. I'm not going down that road. Devil, I am not going where you want to take me. Heart, I'm not going where you want to take me. I belong to Jesus. You get a strength. When we think we belong to ourselves, then eventually we just, you know, we're, we're always more vulnerable to temptation. We're always more vulnerable to the selfishness and the decadence and the greed and the lustfulness and all the mess of this world. When we're stressed out, when we're tired, when we're scared, when we're afraid, that's when we're vulnerable. But when you say to yourself, no, 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 I belong to Jesus. He paid a huge price for me. If you buy some item, you go to a store and buy some, let's say, beautiful piece of pottery and you pay a whole lot of money for it, you're going to make sure that you don't allow that to fall off the shelf and break. You, you, you guard that. You keep that safe because you paid a lot of money for that. When I'm able to say, Jesus paid a whole lot for me. He paid a huge price to set me free from my slavery and bring me again to himself. I belong to him. I'm not going down this road where my heart wants to take me. I'm not going over there because I'm stressed out and tired and kind of bored. I belong to Jesus. Wow. Think of those Christians in that first Roman Empire. That was all they knew. That was all they knew, just the ways of, of living. And, you know, if you lived in a Roman city, we have, you know, unfortunately, all this craziness on the Internet where we're giving these iPhones to six-year-olds and all the pornography and all the decadence and all the anger and all the greed of the world is right in front of their face. We are insane for doing this as a society. But, you know, in the ancient Roman Empire, they had their obscene statues and paintings plastered all over all of their cities. Everywhere you went, there it was right in front of your face. And here's our God saying, but you belong to me. You do not belong to all of this mess. You do not belong to this world. You do not belong to that person who thinks that he owns you. You do not belong to that devil who thinks that he's got you. You do not belong to your brain. You know, they say that inside your own head is the most dangerous place in the world to be. Somebody say amen to that. We get to thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. You don't belong to all the crazy thoughts in your head. Paul the Apostle said, look, I can think and think and think. I want to do the right thing. I want to do the right thing. I want to do the right thing. But then I just outthink myself and I do the wrong thing. When you know you belong to Jesus, you say, no, he paid a price for me. He paid a price for me. He's the king of my heart. He's sitting on the throne of my heart. The Holy Spirit, the one God who's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that's God sitting on the throne of my heart. He's not just a million miles away up there in heaven beyond the universe, right? He's in my heart. He's right here. That is strength to say no. Maybe you are stressed out. Maybe you are tired. Maybe you are bored. Maybe you are afraid. And you just 
being sucked in to what you know is not of God. What you know is just getting hold of you more and more. And here is this reminder from God himself this morning. But you belong to me. But you belong to me. You can guard your heart from that slavery that's ready to grab you again by reminding yourself, I belong. I belong to Jesus. Let's go to Isaiah now, chapter 43. And we'll see a second way that we get this strength, courage, and confidence. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, another way of saying my people, the people of God, he who formed you, O Israel, my people, my, the people of God, he says he who, who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. Fear not, I've redeemed you. I paid a huge price for you. Do you think I'm going to let you be destroyed after I paid this price for you? Here's our father saying, after I gave up my son, after I had to hear my son crying out from hell, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Here's our father saying, do you think after I did that, that I would let anything destroy you? You're mine. I've redeemed you. I paid a huge price for you. So what? Fear not. I've called you by name. We parents think that we named our children. In fact, it was the Lord who put that name in our hearts. He named you and he called you by name. He called you by name when you were in that slavery. When I was 15 years old and I was far away from God and all of a sudden here he is calling my name, knocking at the door of my heart. He says, I've called you by name. I just didn't do something and hope that you all find me. I gave my son on that cross, paid that huge price for you and came calling your name, knocking at the door of your heart. You are mine. And so what do we see here? We see that when you know, when you know that you belong to Jesus, you have an incredible strength, courage and confidence to say no to fear. Say no to sin, to say no to fear. Our number one enemy or the number one weapon that our enemy, the devil, uses against us is fear. He just paralyzes us in fear. Fear of the future, fear of what's going to happen, fear that I'm going to fail, fear that I'm not smart enough, fear of everything in the world. But when you know he paid such a huge price for you, that you belong to him, you have the strength to say no to fear. You have the courage to do what he's calling you to do. You have the confidence to live life well because you belong to him. I watched that movie. I was sitting right down here watching that movie a few weeks ago. I, get that movie if you've never seen it. Whew. And watching that man saying, as those torturers are ready to beat him again, I belong to Jesus. He was not fearing the pain that they were bringing on him. He was not afraid of whatever they might do to him because he knew who he belonged to. Look at verse two here. The Lord goes on, he says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you through the rivers. They shall not overwhelm you. When life comes like a flood, when the troubles of life come like a flood, when the challenges, when the difficulties come like a flood, he says, I will be with you. I'm not gonna abandon you to the flood. I'm not going to let you get drowned in, the, in the, the sorrows and the difficulties and the challenges of this world. You're mine. You belong to me. Wow. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Wow. He said, yeah, you will walk through fiery trials. This world is not easy. Someone say amen. This is only chapter one. Say amen. Whew. This is not the end of the story. When that last trumpet of chapter one sounds and then chapter two begins, whoo, there won't be the fiery trials then. But right now in this chapter one, yes, we walk through fiery trials, but here is our God saying, but you belong to me. You belong to me. When I gave my son on the cross, you humbled yourself and said, thank you. You humbled yourself and cried out for the mercy that he won for you there on that cross. You belong to me. And so I won't let the fiery trials consume you destroy you. You can say no to fear. Wow, I look around this world right now and there is just massive fear 
There's always been massive fear, but we're in a particular season right now of massive fear around this world right now. And we make our worst decisions when we're afraid, when we're worrying about what's going to happen next, when we're worrying about who's going to be in charge next, when we're worrying about where the economy is going, when we're worrying about this, that, and the other thing. That's when we make our worst decisions. We make our best decisions when we know we belong to Jesus, when we know that he is with us, when we know that he will never abandon us, when we know that we are his. That's when we have confidence to say, yes, Lord. That's when we have the courage to do whatever he's calling us to do. Wow. You know, Jesus puts a high calling on our lives. He puts a high calling on our lives. And, you know, he gives you an idea. He gives you a thought maybe some way of reaching out to one particular person with the love of Jesus. And then you start to, you know, think, overthink it. And you're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I know. Or he gives you a vision of some kind of ministry. You know, I've always said to this church all these years now that uh, don't be waiting for the pastor or some committee or something. To, we got rid of all the committees, by the way. Somebody say amen to that. So uh, <laughs> don't be waiting for some committee or the pastor to say, hey, why don't you do this? You jump in. You get involved. Or if the Lord gives you an idea, tell us about it and we'll say, good, let's go for it. But then we start overthinking. We start thinking, wait a minute, but I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if this would work. I don't know if that would work. We never take the first step because we're looking way down the line with all of our fears and worries. Like, I don't know how this will happen. And here's Jesus saying, just take the first step and then you take the second step. And then the next step after that, I will be with you. I will be with you. We say no to fear by remembering who we belong to. You belong to Jesus. Look at Isaiah 44. I love this. One of my favorite verses in scripture. This one will say, I'm the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob. In other words, I'm one of God's people. And another will write on his hand, the Lord's. In other words, I belong to the Lord. And name himself by the name of Israel. This one will say, I belong to Jesus. That one will say, I belong to Jesus. That one will write it on his hands. I belong to Jesus. Maybe you want to write it on your hand or just every time you look at the palm of your hand, just imagine it's right there. I belong to Jesus. I belong. This world will break your heart, won't it? This world will break your heart. And it seems like Jesus is far away. It seems like he's not paying attention because our hearts get so broken. If I can look at my hand and remember, no, I belong to Jesus. And what does the scripture promise? He's near to the brokenhearted. He binds up the wounds of the brokenhearted. Wow. I belong to him. I'm so glad I don't just belong to myself. I'm so glad I don't have to be the king of my own life. I'm so glad I don't have to sit on the throne of my own life and make all the decisions and figure it all out. It's like Jesus said, just think about today and then the next day and then the day after that and then the day after that. He'll guide you. You just do the one next right thing. You just do the one next thing that the Lord's telling you to do step by step by step. Say no to your fears, knowing you belong to Jesus. There's one more thing here. Let's look in Paul's letter to the Romans. He says, likewise, my brothers, my brothers, my sisters. He says, you also, he's talking about himself. And then he says, you also, just like me, he says, have died to the law, to the body of Christ. What does that mean? So Paul, the slavery that Paul had found himself in before he, he, Jesus came calling to him was a slave to the law. In other words, he thought that he pretty much did everything better than everyone else. In other words, he obeyed the law of God. He did it right. He pretty much thought he did it more right. He did it better. He obeyed God more completely, more fully than just about anyone else. And he was a slave to it. He was a slave to it. It was maybe some kind of ancient version of perfectionism, but in fact, he was an utter disaster. In fact, he thought he was obeying the, the law of God, the commandments of God so perfectly, but in fact, he was treating people horribly, terribly. But he said, you also have died, just like I. He said, I died to all that, through the body of Christ. When I realized what Jesus did for me, when I realized that he had to go to hell because of me and every single one of us, 
I died to all that. I realized I wasn't as perfect as I thought I was. I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. I wasn't as good as I thought I was. I died to all of that. You also have died to the law through the body of Christ, through what Jesus did for you, so that, look at this, you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, so that you will belong to him in order that we may bear fruit for God. In order that we may bear fruit to God. What did Paul also write in this letter to the Romans? He said every commandment of God, and he lists a bunch of them, are fulfilled in one commandment, that you love one another. So what is this? This means that when I know I belong to Jesus, I have the strength, the courage, and the confidence to say yes to love. To say yes to love. I will be a person who loves my neighbor, who loves my family, who loves my enemy. I will be a person who bears fruit for God because I know I belong to Jesus. Paul thought he was bearing a lot of fruit. He thought he was, he was a great guy doing all the right thing. He was a pretty terrible person, really terrible. In fact, he said, I'm the chief of all sinners. He says, I came to realize, when I realized what Jesus did for me, I came to realize what a complete mess I was. His eyes were open to himself. He wasn't loving people at all, though that's what the scripture says over and over again. Love. He realized he wasn't doing at all what God put him here to do until he made up his mind. I will say yes to Jesus. I will belong to him. And when, when he realized he belonged to Jesus, then he had the strength to love people that he didn't like. Then he had the courage to love people even when it was pretty frightening to do so. Then he had the confidence to love even when he didn't really know exactly what that meant in this situation. He had the confidence to do what God was telling him to do. We get that strength, that courage, that confidence to love even our enemies. When you're set free from fear, when you're set free from rebellious sinfulness, when you're set free from all that mess, then you've got the courage and you've got the strength and you've got the confidence to bear fruit, to love as you have been loved. Do you have faith in Jesus? Have you put your faith in Jesus? If not, choose Jesus. He went there to pay the price for you so that you could belong to him. If you have that faith, but you're sinking into some slavery, something's got hold of you, cry out to him. We're going to pray. I'm going to invite you to this altar, whatever prayer you might have this morning. I would, if you'd like someone to pray with you, I would be glad to pray with you here. You're welcome to come. Let's, let's all pray together. Father, we thank you and we love you and we just lift up our hearts to you, Lord God. We would pray, Father, that, Lord, you would give us this, this assurance that we do belong to you. You will never abandon us. You will never leave us. You will let nothing destroy us because we do belong to you. You've paid a huge price for us. And so, Father, we pray for that strength. We pray for that courage. We pray for that confidence. We pray for anyone here right now, uh, anyone online worshiping who, who doesn't have this faith yet. Lord, touch each heart. Increase our faith. Give us faith to believe, to look to trust in Jesus. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In his name we pray, amen and amen. Let's stand, we're going to sing to our God. You are very welcome to come here to this altar for prayer.
heavens will be opened just like you promised Christ shall come again we will be God bless each of you and your families. Go in God's peace and have a great week.